Hey, this is Chris with Clinician Connection, and I'm here with Mary Dye from the Prosperity Eating Disorder Clinic here. And uh, her and her partner, Angie, are going to actually be doing a presentation for us at the conference. So we want to take a minute to get to you know, know Mary a little more and give you guys an opportunity to hear a little bit about her and what she's bringing and why she's even, you know, why she's passionate and interested about joining us in April. So, uh, yeah, Mary, so thank you so much for taking a few minutes to talk with me. Um, I'm, I'm curious, Lisa, who's my partner, we, we put this conference together. We asked a handful of people, hey, do you want to participate? Is this something you'd like to, to speak at or be a part of? When you got that question, what got you like excited or what is it about you that you're like, oh my gosh, yes, this is something I want to be a part of? Uh, well, let's see. So I am born and raised in Hampton Roads, but um, Virginia Beach specifically. And then I moved away. Uh, college, didn't know I'd be back. And I got back here about six years ago. And just, you know, being out in other cities and, you know, um, learning about and treating eating disorders and really diving into mental health and building those connections in other cities was fabulous. And remembering what it had been like growing up here in Virginia, we just really didn't seem to have the resources or maybe we didn't know how to access them and that sort of thing. So it has been such a passion area since moving back here. And it is why I moved back here about six years ago was to bring more services to this community. Um, so mm. that is a big passion piece for me. And so every time that I make connections with other clinicians, other providers, I'm so excited. And so when you all contacted us um, wanting to, you know, put this conference together and gathering speakers, it was such an honor um, personally just to be included and, and so exciting that you were giving space to eating disorders, because whether people realize this or not, we have really been a desert in accessing any treatment um, in Hampton Road. So it's, it's just really exciting to get to partner with people, have collaborations, and um, educate the community, yeah. the public, the providers about about this niche. Yeah, yeah I think I think eating disorders are some, there's something that even like the most seasoned therapists can still get a little like hung up on. I mean, I've had I've had conversations with friends and colleagues of mine who have felt the need to like immediately stop or refer out yeah. if a client yeah. of their has. And it's not, it doesn't come from a malicious place or anything. It's just either feeling unequipped or a little nervous or scared about, you know, can I handle this? You know, and, and I always try, and you're the expert here for sure, but I, I always try to say, hey, like, you're still their support person. Like, yes. you know, there may be room to bring in some other care or collaborators, yeah, yeah. but you're, you're more than equipped to still be someone's support, even if you don't know the ins and outs of this particular type of disorder. Yeah, um, sometimes that provider is the key to get them to the specialty services that they need. And they still need that provider in their life, so to speak, to be like rooting for them and reminding them of their tools and creating that safe space because they might say, come to me. And I should tell you, I'm a, I'm a dietitian, so I'm a dietitian coming to this conference. Um, but we talk about it as nutrition therapy because we always are working with our partners in, in the mental health sure. realm. And it's really counseling our clients through making those changes. Um, so often even to get into that dietitian that's going to help them, we have to have them with a, a strong therapeutic connection with their provider to trust us because then I'm going to take on this role of changing their food and changing all these, this movement and the, the areas that are causing them so much distress and body changes. So they they still need you. Um, but I, I love that you brought this up because even for me in all through school, all through graduate school, it was sort of this idea of like, oh my gosh, an eating disorder, refer them on. Like that's a whole other thing. It's really hard to touch that. And I come across providers in all different disciplines from medicine, you know, therapy, psychiatry, all of that, that are terrified to continue working with a person with an eating disorder because we have all heard about the, you know, mortality rate with anorexia and the fact that there's this big medical complexity. And that is true. And it's what I love about eating disorder work. I'm never treating alone. I'm on a team 
therapy, psychiatry, medicine, and nutrition, we all work just in tandem to get that client all the support. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we tell people that enough and we want to be sure that everyone feels comfortable with accessing resources, team collaboration to really support those really high need clients. It's true. Um, some of them, maybe the medical complexity is a little daunting, but when you know you have a team with you, you can do it. Yeah. So we, you know, we're hoping that, you know, there'll be plenty of therapists from so many different backgrounds and focuses. Right. Um, and I'm just, you know, if we had somebody say, well, hey, I think I'm going to pass on this workshop because I don't treat eating disorders primarily. What would be your... What you do. Of, you yeah, haven't what realized. Be, right. Well, what would be your thought to say, hey, even if you're not, that's not your area of focus, here's why this is a beneficial conversation for you to be a part of. Because eating disorders are far more common than any of the research tells us. And at any given time, even if it's not a full-blown diagnostic eating disorder, any given time, 70% of people are doing things to change their body or having some sort of body image struggles or distress or using food and body and movement as coping tools to get through other things. Um, and we live in diet culture, which is constantly pounding us all with messages that we are not enough as we are, that there's this perfectionistic kind of ideal or whatever. Um, so everyone that walks through any of our doors is, you know, getting the pressures that are out there. So might have some, some things going on, but also eating disorders don't at all look like the after school special that I remember seeing when I was <laughs> growing up. Um, the, the clients here with us today, I'm, I'm here talking to you from our treatment facility, they are all shapes, all sizes, all races, all genders, are all sexual orientation, all ages. Um, we treat kids as young as 10 and we've had people up into their you know late 60s, early 70s struggling. So you just can't make any assumptions about who is or isn't struggling in this capacity or, or using you know, eating and movement behaviors as, as their coping tool really maladaptively. Um, so sometimes I will work with providers who, you know, we finally are assessing their client for eating disorder. Maybe they've had a very, you know, multi-year relationship with this client, never getting to the eating piece because there's other stuff going on or the weight piece, um, but it's been there. So often it's there. We're just maybe not focused on that part, um, but we want everyone to feel comfortable assessing. And I think any provider, um, just in our own lives, doesn't even have to be in the clinical sense of how we talk about bodies and people and differences and all of that, it, it all kind of comes back to this for me. Um, because if we, no matter what our area that we treat is, I hope that anyone working in um, mental health is trying to help our clients find, you know, value in themselves and self-love and um, feel like they're enough. And there's a lot of pitfalls that I think just being part of the wider culture that we tend just as humans to fall into, which actually reinforce the idea that people are not okay as they are. And so I think everyone can kind of learn language to maybe incorporate and language to maybe not bring in um just with respect to the fact that anyone sitting in that chair across from you could be struggling and you might not know it yeah no that's so good so i would definitely encourage anybody who is watching or listening to this if you're coming to our conference definitely consider hanging with uh mary and her partner angie as they talk to us through this what what can folks expect to get from their time with you if they come hang out at your workshop with us? Yeah, well, we're hoping to make it very practical. I mean, I don't want to slam anyone with all the statistics and all the all the stuff or make anyone more worried about treating any disorders. What we're really hoping to do is just um, give you some kind of simple, straightforward assessment tools, increase the comfort level of broaching these topics with clients, um, avoiding those pitfalls of, I mean, it could be as simple as, hey, you look great, you like, look like you like lost a little or whatever, like that, you know, is a culturally very common statement and could just be detrimental. I say to anyone, it's never great yeah. thing to talk about weight ever, um, but particularly devastating. And that might sound a little extreme, but 
I mean, I don't think a week goes by that we don't have clients come through these doors in tears saying, oh, this small meeting person said this thing. And it just sets us back weeks yeah. in their progress. So, so and that's what's really so hard about it is because it is a well-meaning person. It's not yes. somebody trying to hurt you or. No, and it's a very culturally normative thing to say. I, I'm going to say unfortunately, but it is. Um, but it can be so loaded. So we want to. We're not here to make everyone feel badly about what they've said. We've all said different things, um, but just to help everyone kind of see it from, from some different perspectives and maybe walk themselves back out of some situations like that and to just increase like the comfort and um, ability in referring out or bringing in more team members on a case where you might say, you know, my client and I have this great connection. I want to stay a support. Fabulous. That is super powerful. And let's bring in an appropriate person to help confront these other avenues. Um, so that's really what we're hoping to do. Our big mission is just to get anyone out there who's struggling more access to compassionate care and teams. And so we've got to help providers be able to feel like, all right, we can do it. We can bring more providers yeah. in. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking some time to talk with me. Before I let you go, I, I always like to ask this question as I'm getting to know somebody is, if you were not doing mental health work, what kind of work do you think you would be doing? Like, what's your dream? Like, kind of that, you could even be that thing when you were a kid. I was like, I'm always going to be an astronaut or something. Like, what's your dream gig? So I always wanted to be an Egyptologist. Um, and I actually, my undergrad is in anthropology. So cultural anthropology, I think I would want okay. to be doing that i'm not sure where um but it's interesting because always what interested me was food ways food cultures food connections and the passing of tradition and culture through shared food experience so it's i use that a lot in my nutrition counseling um so i think i would still be in that realm a little bit but i have gotten really um i'm gonna go ahead and use the word obsessive about these baby elephants at an orphanage in kenya <laughs> Um, my daughter and I recently read a book on orphaned elephants, and okay. every day I have to check up on them, the Sheldrick Wildlife um, Center. And so whatever I'm doing, I would hope that I would have like big periods of time and I guess the financial access to be able to go there someday. That's kind of my, that my dream. That sounds awesome. I, I'm just really into those elephants right now they're they're my little sparks of joy in the day like i take those little pauses it's not cat videos it's elephant orphans um something in that capacity but yeah in, in that's yeah. that's like the, that's like taking cat videos to the next level the next <laughs> so. level i mean uh there's a lot of tears but a lot of smiles and, and laughs too um so my daughter and i watch those together but um yeah something with culinary still involved i i just i I love yeah, food. that's, that's <laughs> awesome. I always tell people mine is probably something like I want to be a chef or um, I'd probably go just play my guitar in the mountains by myself for the rest of my life. Amazing. So we've so, got the same, we have a practical dream and then we have like a, the, just let's go and do something. We yeah, really I used to, I used to joke, I used to joke, anybody want to pay me to go play my guitar on a mountain? <laughs> so well, thanks Someone, for, uh, really. yeah, thanks. Thanks for hanging. Those Thank of you, you who are watching, listening, if you uh, are interested in coming and hanging out with us in April, you can go to clinicianconnection.net and check out the conference, pick up a ticket. If you have questions, you can email us hello at clinicianconnection.net. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing you all at the beach. Uh, thanks again, Mary. We'll see Thank you in April. Thank you. Have a great one.